ladies, thank you. Alice, thank you for letting us know that it is national, not just popover day, but blueberry popover day. But if you haven't already, you need to, on your way to your small group, and don't linger long, but you need to go to the treat table. There are some scrumptious looking desserts on that table that are from South Africa. And I think that I, I was in South Africa right before the lockdown, and let me tell you, those ladies there know how to cook. So you need to stop by there and help yourself take it into your small group, but it looks delicious and spectacular. So thank you, ladies, for doing that. Welcome this morning. We're so glad to see you. There's some new faces this morning. We especially welcome all of you. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study of the book of Joshua. You know, Oswald Chambers lived one of the most extraordinary Christian pilgrimages of the 20th century. He was a native of Scotland, but his ministry of preaching and teaching took him all over the world, including to the United States and as far away as Japan. He founded a Bible training college in London, and then he actually served as the chaplain to the Australian and New Zealand troops who were stationed in Egypt guarding the Suez Canal during World War I. Tragically, he died at the young age of 43 from complications of appendicitis after he refused to go to the military hospital and take a bed that was desperately needed by the soldiers that were wounded in the Third Battle of Gaza. Over the course of his ministry, though, his wife, Biddy, who was trained as a stenographer, had taken careful, copious notes of all of his sermons and his lectures. And then after his death, she compiled all those notes and she created a devotional book that she titled with Chambers' life motto, My Utmost for His Highest. I shared with you last week that its title motivates me constantly to find and give my utmost gifts and service to God's highest purpose for my life and for my work. You know, Chambers once said this, if we are going to live as disciples of Jesus, we have to remember that all noble things are difficult. The Christian life is gloriously difficult, but the difficulty of it does not make us faint and cave in. It rouses us up to overcome. All noble things are difficult. You know, many of you have relatives who served in the military and have experienced horrible atrocities in helping to defend our country's freedom. Our military is currently engaged in a war against terrorism around the world, helping to defend, protect our lives from those who wish to take them. Freedom is difficult. Most adults have completed 13 years of education. Most have gone on and done an additional four years of college. And then many more beyond that have done advanced studies. Educational preparation is difficult. Let's face it, being a mother is difficult. Sleepless nights, up with sick children, all those lunches to pack and fights to referee, and then there's all those sock shoes and homework assignments to find. You're on call 24-7, you don't get paid except in kisses, and you never get a day off. And then your little children grow up. My mother always used to say, when your children are little, you have little problems. But when your children are big, you have big problems. Now I understand what she meant. While it is undeniably the best job in the world, being a mother is difficult. And it's no different in serving the Lord in building his kingdom. The New Testament commentator William Barclay said this, we progress in life and faith in proportion to the fair that we are willing to pay. The book of Joshua calls us to a higher level of obedience to God's purpose, to an unconditional commitment to his plan for our lives. This second chapter of Joshua is going to encourage us because it shows us that God precedes us, that he has already provided for all that he wants us to be and to do. And when we see that all that has God has done to prepare us, 
then we can step into our calling with confident obedience. But the very first thing that we must do is to take the risk to serve the Lord. Let's look at the second chapter of Joshua this morning. I think that it will most definitely encourage us. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the second chapter of Joshua, and we'll begin reading with the very first verse. If you don't have your Bible, there are Bibles in the pew backs in front of you. I think that the um, text will also be projected on the screens behind me. So Joshua chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, these men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came here, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them under the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. And the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan, as far as the fords. And the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. So the battle for Canaan is about to commence. But where exactly should Joshua begin his attack? Jericho is a very logical first option. Jericho was situated just north of the Dead Sea, five miles west of the Jordan River, and it sat 20 miles from what would eventually become the city of Jerusalem. Its location made it a strategic military base because the city of Jericho stood at the base of the roads which climbed beyond into the mountains of Palestine. Once the city was captured and the roads beyond were made defensible, then it would be easier to claim the mountains, and then the Israelites could use the mountains to wage war, attack, on the valleys down below. But here's the problem with that idea. The city of Jericho was extremely well fortified. The natural springs within the city walls made it self-sufficient. And as a result, Jericho could withstand a siege not just for weeks, or even months, but for years. Its walls were among the tallest and thickest of its day. In fact, archaeologists have found multiple layers of populations who lived at this site dating back in time as far as 7,000 BC, making Jericho the oldest continuously occupied city on the face of the earth. So a victory here would encourage the Israelites just as it would discourage their enemies. And it would give Joshua's armies a strategic base for all their operations to follow. But defeat here? Hmm. It would be catastrophic. The Jewish army would be forced to withdraw, and they would have to try to enter the land somewhere else. The Canaanites would be strengthened in their resolve, and they would be fortified in their defense of the land. The Israelites would become discouraged. And they might even begin to doubt Joshua's leadership. You know, Moses had never led them to a place of defeat. Joshua must win his first battle in the promised land for the sake of his future as their leader. So should they even attack Jericho? Should they go around this fortified, invincible city and enter the promised land somewhere else once their armies are stronger? Since Jericho lay in the middle of Cana, there were other ways to enter this land. The question here was not whether the Jews would commence their attack of the promised land. The question is, where should they begin? You know, you're going to see all throughout this book of Joshua that Joshua will prove himself to be a brilliant military strategist. But he began his career as leader of this nation with this decision. He would send two spies into Jericho and the surrounding area. They would help him decide whether or not the Lord intended this to be the first stage of their battle strategy. Our text says that the two spies were sent from the plains of Shittim, which means Akasha trees. These trees would mark the location 
of the great victory to come for all the generations that would follow. But first, these spies are forced to exercise enormous courage. Their enemies would be anticipating their rival, just as they did. If the king of Jericho could capture them, then he could defeat Joshua's attack before it had even begun. The military attention of the entire city and the surrounding area would be focused against them. You know, we're never told the names of these two brave soldiers, but they're two of the unnamed heroes of scripture, models of risk-taking and courageous faith. So these two spies slipped across the Jordan River and into the city, and the very first verse of our text tells us that they entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there. You know, few people or stories in the Bible are more famous than the account that follows. But who exactly was this woman, Rahab? The Hebrew word that is translated prostitute can also be translated innkeeper. And Josephus and some of the other ancient Jewish historians attempted to defend Rahab's honor by arguing that God would never have selected a woman of such immoral character for responsibility and honor as great as this. But the New Testament describes Rahab with words that leave no doubt as to her occupation. In Hebrews 11.31, in the Hall of Fame of the Great People of Faith in the Scripture, the writer calls her Rahab the prostitute. The list includes Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and then all of a sudden, Rahab the prostitute. James 2.25 likewise calls her Rahab the prostitute. But unlike the Hebrew word, which can also be translated as innkeeper, the word that is used here in the Greek can only be translated as prostitute. Rahab was clearly a woman who sold sexual favors as her livelihood. But then her profession was all just a part of her testimony. So why did the spies enter her house first? Out of all the houses and places they could enter this city, why did they go to Rahab's house? Well, probably for several reasons. First, it wouldn't be unusual for strangers to enter the house of a prostitute because back in the ancient times, when a man went to visit a prostitute, he always left his home and city in order to do this. Second, her house was easily accessible to them. It was situated on the edge of the city, but still within its walls. Archaeologic evidence demonstrates that the walls of Jericho were so thick that many of those were actually made into apartments. Now, those living within the walls would be the first line of defense for the city, warning of intruders long before those living in houses inside the city walls would even know about it. And so over time, these apartments became less desirable than the houses in the city, and they came to be commonly used by social outcasts, just like Rahab. Third, Rahab's occupation would make her less likely to be supportive of her king and her fellow citizens than those with other vocations. She very well could have known the sexual sins of many of the leading citizens in Jericho. Perhaps she had been sold into prostitution years earlier by her family when they needed to pay a debt to a wealthy citizen living in Jericho. Or perhaps she was forced into prostitution at the death of her husband when no one in the city would help to provide for her family. It was likely that she would resent the current authorities and she would be more amenable to the Jewish army and its plans. While the spies chose her house for logical reasons, Rahab received them for reasons which speak far less of logic and much more of faith. You see, Rahab knew far more about them than they would have expected. And she took an enormous risk in welcoming these spies. She would expect the king to come looking for them. And she knew that she would be killed if she was found sheltering them. Rahab demonstrated just as much courage as the spies that she protected. But let's just pause for a moment and glance at the rest of Rahab's story. As you know, Jericho would fall to the Jewish armies. Rahab and her family would be spared as a result of her faithfulness. And for her obedience, 
she would be preserved in God's word as a model of courageous faith. Hebrews 11.31, I think we have a slide of this, said, By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And then James 2.25 says, And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? But what's even more fascinating is that Rahab the prostitute would enter the genealogic line of Jesus Christ himself. You know, in Matthew, in the very first chapter of Matthew's gospel, Matthew gives us a very detailed account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, beginning with Abraham and going all the way to Christ. And in that very fifth verse of that first chapter of Matthew, you find this, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab. Rahab's son Boaz would marry Ruth in one of the great love stories of all of literature. Boaz would continue the line from Abraham to David, making Rahab a part of the royal family of King David. And that line would eventuate in the birth of Jesus Christ, making Rahab a part of the Messiah's family line as well. You know, in a very real sense, all of us who have Christ as our Savior are a part of her family. Rahab is a spiritual ancestor to us all. Thomas Akempis once wrote this, If thy heart were right, then every creature would be a mirror of life and a book of holy doctrine. There is no creature so small and abject, but it reflects the goodness of God. And Rahab proves that it is so. May I challenge each one of you ladies that's here this morning by saying to you that if your service to the Lord does not involve risk, then it is not noble enough. But when you are about to step courageously into God's purpose, know that your heavenly Father has gone before you. He has already prepared the way every single time. Let me share with you a really remarkable, I think even miraculous, example of this. In 1908, newly commissioned missionaries John and Jesse Perkins were on board a steamship rounding the coast of Liberia. They knew that God had called them to Africa, but they didn't know exactly where God intended them to serve, where he wanted them to get off the ship. Unbeknownst to the Perkins, God was already at work. There was a young man living in the region whose name was Jasper Toe. He was a God-fearing man, and he practiced the tribal animistic religious rituals of his ancestors that had been passed down to him. But he had never once heard the name of Jesus. One night, Jasper stepped out from his hut, and he looked up into the night sky, and he prayed a very simple prayer. He said, if there is a God in heaven, help me find you. As Jasper stood out under the stars at night, a voice that he had never heard before spoke to him so clearly. And this voice said, go to Garraway Beach. He said, you will see a box on the water with smoke coming out of it. And from that box will come some people in a smaller box. They will tell you how to find me. And so Jasper Toe traveled seven days on foot, arriving on Gar at Garraway Beach on Christmas Day, 1908. And from the shore, as he stood there, he looked off into the distance, and on the water, he saw a black box, a steamship, with smoke coming from the box. And from that box came a smaller box with some people. But before that box was lifted down, John and Jesse Perkins, at the minute that Jasper Toe had arrived on that beach, that's when they sensed God saying, this is it. It's here. Get off this ship right here. Now, John and Jesse went to the captain. They said, you have to stop the ship. They go, we need to get off the ship here. And the captain just looked at him incredulously and said, you don't understand this is cannibal country. You can't get off the ship here. People go in there and they never, ever come back. But John Perkins says, 
you don't understand. This is where God is calling us to serve. So the captain brought that ship to a halt, and they lowered the Perkins and all their belongings down in a surf boat. And the Perkins rowed to shore in that little black box. And Jasper Toe was standing on the shore waiting to welcome them. He motioned for them to follow him. They didn't even speak each other's language, but they followed Jasper Toe seven days to his village. They eventually learned the language and they started a church there. And their very first convert, you won't be surprised to hear, Jasper Toe. But the Perkins' legacy is the hundreds of churches that they and Jasper Toe helped to establish in the country of Liberia. Let me challenge you this morning to take the risk to serve the Lord. And just like the Perkins, you will find that it is really no risk at all. God has already gone before you. Second, expect God to provide for your needs. The king of Jericho was lord of a miniature kingdom. But at this period in time, Egypt was really the great power that was in control of Cana. But as long as the kings of the cities and the, the municipalities paid tribute to the pharaoh, they could pretty much manage their cities as they wanted. The walled cities of this period in ancient history were not large. In fact, archaeologists and historians estimate that Jericho was only six acres in size. The kings and the nobles and the wealthier people obviously lived within the walls. The tenant farmers, the poorer people outside the walls, and they paid taxes to the king for his protection. Now, the king and his military leaders had already heard about the Israelites who were camped on the eastern shore of the Jordan River, as Rahab made clear. Remember, Jericho only is five miles from the Jordan River. The city of Jericho was on terror alert, so to speak, as America has often been lately. They somehow knew that Jewish spies had come, and they went to Rahab seeking them, perhaps for the very reasons that the spies sought out her house first when they entered the city. Their mission was to find and kill these spies, to dissuade the Jewish people from crossing the Jordan River and attacking their city of Jericho. And it's likely that such an action would have had the desired effect. On some level, the conquest of Canaan hung in the balance here. Rahab's report to the king's men was both brilliant and also unexpected. She blatantly lied to these soldiers. If they had chosen to search her house and they'd found the spies, she couldn't claim ignorance. She was an unlikely source of protection for the army of God. But then it was all just a part of God's plan. Now, there may be some of you here this morning that are troubled by the fact that God appears to have used deliberate deception to further his purposes. I mean, Rahab clearly broke the ninth commandment. You shall not bear or give false testimony. While we can't expect Rahab to know the Torah and keep it, we would expect God's people to refuse such deception. But if Rahab had kept the ninth commandment against lying, then she would have broken the sixth commandment against murder. When Cory Tin Boom and her family hid Jewish refugees during the early days of Nazism in Holland, and German soldiers would come to their door demanding to know if they were hiding Jews, they were forced to make Rahab's choice. Now, I know that there's a lot to discuss here ethically, and I agree with that. Does the end always justify the means? Are we here espousing situational ethics? I obviously don't have all the answers. But here's what I do think is probably the bottom line. Always remember that while the book of Joshua describes Rahab's behavior, it is in no way prescribing it for us. There's a lot of sin that's described in the Bible. I mean, David committing adultery with Bathsheba and then murdering Uriah immediately comes to mind. But never does the Bible teach us to practice the immorality that it describes. In any case, Rahab hid these two Jewish spies under stalks of flax on a rooftop just in case the king's men didn't believe her and they made a decision to search her home. To this day, people who live in that dry, arid climate still lay crops and clothes on their rooftops to dry in the hot sun. But never has a rooftop hidden more important individuals than these two men.
The result was that the king didn't look any further for the spies within the city. And his men were occupied for days searching for them outside the city walls. The Jewish soldiers had complete safety to finish their reconnaissance and report back to their general. The will of God never leaves where the grace of God cannot sustain. When you can't find the answer around you, look up. There is always a rooftop of safety. There is always a Rahab just waiting to help God's people fulfill God's purpose by God's provision. Always. And then third, look to the past to find faith for the future. What follows is one of the most remarkable confessions of faith to be found in the word of God. Let's look at Rahab's statement of faith. Turn over to, still in chapter 2, but we're going to look at verse 9. Chapter 2, verse 9, and this is what Rahab said. I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Shine and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on earth beneath. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that just beautiful? The Lord, Rahab's word for God in verse 9, was the Hebrew name Yahweh. This was God's covenant name. The I am, the one who is and was and ever shall be. Her faith in Israel's God is immediately evident. Just like if you meet someone today and they refer to God as the Lord, you have this sense that they probably have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Rahab already knew that God had given the Jews the land. She, had all, she already knew what God had done for them. And now she knows that their God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Isn't that just amazing? Rahab found God. Or perhaps more precisely, God found Rahab. He spotted a tender heart in this hard city, and he reached out to save her. He would have saved the entire city if anyone else had asked. But then maybe Rahab had an advantage over the other citizens of Jericho. You see, she had nothing to lose. She was already at the bottom of the rung, so to speak. She'd already lost her reputation, her social standing, her chance for any advancement. But her profession of faith mattered far more than her profession as a prostitute. Rahab knew what God had done in the past and trusted him for what he would do now and in the future. She trusted these foreign spies and their nation for her own future more than she trusted her own king and her own people. And she was right. Look at verse 12. It says this, Now then, Please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign. Rahab here asked the Jewish soldiers to deal kindly with her and her family using the Hebrew word hesed, one of the great Hebrew words. This word is akin to agape in the Greek, and it stands for unconditional love, absolute acceptance, grace and mercy bestowed. It's a covenant word within the context of the Hebrew faith. By using it, she was asking them to treat her as a member of the covenant community. It was a profession of faith, so to speak, on her part, stating that she believed in their God as her God and asking them to receive her and her family as a part of their own. These Hebrew spies, as it turns out, were actually missionaries. They thought they were on a reconnaissance mission. They weren't. From the very get-go, God's plan was to collapse the walls of Jericho just like a line of dominoes. 
He didn't need these two spies to collect any intelligence. I believe with all my heart that God sent these spies to reach Rahab. Coming into Jericho, there couldn't have been a more unlikely candidate to make a commitment of faith to the God of Israel than Rahab the prostitute. Not only could Rahab look to God's dealings in the past to find faith for her future, but now these spies could look to their experience with Rahab as an encouragement for the entire nation. And we will see that they did. And then lastly, we are to step with obedience into the plan of God. Let's look at the rest of our text this morning, beginning with verse 14. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. And then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. Remember, her apartment's in the wall. And she said to them, go into the hills or the pursuers will encounter you and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward, you may go your way. The men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on your own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with us in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you made us swear. And she said, According to your word, so be it. And then she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. You see, there was a catch here. Obedience was required of Rahab, just as it was of the Israelites. And she did as she was told, refusing to betray the spies and attaching the scarlet rope that would signify her home to the Jewish attackers who were to come. The Jews would see in this scarlet rope a reminder of the blood over their doors at the Passover. And Christians would forever find it a foreshadowing of the blood that Christ shed on the cross for each one of us. But these two Jewish soldiers demonstrated their own obedience, returning at risk to Joshua and his army. They fled first to the west of Jericho, where the hills and mountains were dotted with caves made by centuries of the weather beating against the sandstone that you find there. They would be difficult to find, but less secure than with Rahab. But disobedience was no option for their courageous faith. When they returned to their general, they gave a full account of their reconnaissance. And in marked contrast to the spies who had first surveyed the land with Joshua 40 years earlier, listen to what they said. Look down at verse 24 of our text. It says, truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands. And also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. And with that, Joshua had all the answers that he needed. And the most important military battle for the conquest of the promised land would commence shortly. God promises each one of us that he will always prepare his children for the purpose to which he has called them. He promises to precede us into battle with the assurance of his providence as well as his power. We can seldom know beforehand how he will keep these promises. No one would have ever, ever imagined at the beginning of the second chapter of Joshua that Rahab the prostitute would be its central hero and would become one of the great figures in biblical history. In fact, the author gives Rahab an entire chapter. More is written about her than the spies, the priests, or Joshua's right-hand men. Rahab's headline position announces this. God has a very special place for the Rahabs of this world. But now we know what they did not. And all that we have seen of God teaches us to trust him for all that we have not yet seen. You know, Corrie ten Boom was the only member of her family to survive the Nazi concentration camps. She experienced human depravity 
and suffering at its absolute worst. And as a result, she could speak with authority when she said this. When a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and you trust the engineer. You trust the engineer. Since the world was made, God has never broken one of his promises to his trusting children. Here's how you can know that you can trust him with your life. He gave his life for you. So if a Holocaust survivor whose sister died in the concentration camp can trust the engineer, then so can I. And so can you. Step into God's calling for your future with the same confidence and obedience that the Israelites did in our study today. The Lord didn't bring us this far to leave us. This is the promise of our God. Would you pray with me? Our dear Heavenly Father, you are an awesome God. We just stand in awe of you. You are the great I am, the one who is and was and is to come. And we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you have a plan for your, our, our lives. It's a greater plan than we could have even imagined for ourselves. Lord, help us to believe that you have already taken care of every detail to help us accomplish that plan, that you've already gone before us. Don't let us be fearful. Help us to believe. Help our unbelief, Lord. Help us to step out with faithful obedience into your plan for our life. Lord, I thank you for each woman that's here this morning. I thank you for her heart that it desires to know you more dearly and to study your word. And, and, you know, I know they could be somewhere else this morning, but they've chosen to come here, Lord. And so I just pray that you would bless them in a very special way this morning. Just be with our small groups that are to follow. Um, just may um, our hearts be blessed as a result of our fellowship with these other women. We thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. And we thank you that we can trust you for our lives because you gave your life for each one of us. We ask these things in thy son's most precious name. Amen.